the lion and the other beasts formed an alliance to go a-hunting. When they had taken a fat stag, the lion divided it into three parts. The first, said he, belongs to me, as I am your king. The second I shall take for my personal share in the chase. And as for the third part, let him take it, who dares? Now Gellert gives us a new title. He calls it the distribution of wealth. And if we look at the image, we see a giant vacuum cleaner, clearly indicating the capitalist accumulation of wealth. And it's basically sucking up everything created, not just by individual workers, but by whole towns and whole factories. Hi, I'm Sarah Monison, and I'm a political theorist and classicist at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, near Chicago. Hugo Gellert was an American graphic artist of Hungarian descent. He emigrated to the United States as a teenager with his family. He was active in New York as a muralist, illustrator, cartoonist from about 1918 uh, through to his death in 1985. He was really well known and a very important fixture of sort of a New York City art world from about 1918 through the 1930s, the Red Decade. Gellert self-identified as a proletarian artist and as a culture worker. He was uh, concerned throughout his life to make sure that his art always took into account the urgent political issues of the day. As a people's artist, as Gellert would say, he rejected easel painting and sculptures and things that required patrons and uh, industrialists of the period to sort of be behind his work, and instead uh, did work with in, um, illustration for magazines, pamphlets, uh, and also books. In the 1930s in New York City, they were suffering from the after effects of the Great Crash of 1929. It was a depression, not a lot of work. But one huge public works project was going on in the center of the city, which employed a huge number of artists, and that was the construction of Rockefeller Center. Rockefeller Center, as a urban planning project, and in the artwork, that was commissioned for many of its venues, aimed, I think, to valorize and even heroize the accomplishments of industrial capitalism. Um, famously, there's the Prometheus statue in the center of the square of, of Rockefeller Center. There's also the famous Atlas statue. Uh, and um, Hugo Gellert, two books that I'm going to tell you about, were responding to a great deal of the artwork that was produced for Rockefeller Center. While much of the artwork in Rockefeller Center uh, was celebrating industrialists as the real inheritors of the classical tradition and the am great ambitions for achievement and human excellence that uh, the classical world sort of symbolized at the time, uh, Hugo Gellert was eager to sort of recover a plurality of voices in the ancient world. And one of the things that he did in the two sources, uh, these two books, uh, was highlight or foreground these other voices that he thought could be progenitors of a critique of decadent capitalism, as he called it. And, uh, inspirational figures from the classical past for progressives uh, in the United States and elsewhere. The first book that I want to talk about by Gellert, which is Karl Marx, Capital in Lithograph, features John D. Rockefeller Jr., um, J.P. Morgan, Henry Ford, and President Hoover uh, in the company of Al Capone, lording it over uh, or actually conspiring with a bunch of thugs, among whom are also police, luring it over some uh, workers who are identified as this imprisoned figure here who was um, a notable activist uh, at the time. What's significant about this book is that Gellert aimed to um, produce a work that could convey the central theses of Karl Marx's great economic treatise, Capital, to a 
popular audience. So what he did was take brief excerpts from the work, obviously in translation in English, that were designed to give you the sort of kernel of the different logical steps in the grand argument. And alongside each of these sort of little chapters that outline the argument, he offered a graphic interpretation of the core of the point. It is my hope that in this abbreviated form, the immortal work of Karl Marx will become accessible to the masses, to the huge army of workers without jobs and farmers without land, to the workers in the mills and the mines, to all who toil with brain or brawn. This book is made for them. And he talks about this work being a translation into graphic form of the revolutionary concepts of Das Kapital and as a work that he offers both to his fellow artists and to his fellow workers. And he very much understood himself to be a culture worker. Gellick's work on Marx uh, is very concerned to abbreviate the argument. So it's really quite stunning that on three separate occasions he features classical sources and the way Marx used classical sources to make his points and to emphasize the authority of his points. When he is explaining the concepts of exchange value and commodification, uh, Marx quotes from Aristotle and Gellert chooses to produce a quite stunning portrait of Aristotle in this particular moment. My favorite portrait of Aristotle anywhere. <laughs> it's really quite remarkable to see Aristotle as a hero of the uh, working class. And there's a, another image that uh, is also reproduced on the um, website of his use of the story of Ixion to discuss Marx's uh, examination of the prolongation of the working day. So what's really striking here is that in a short book uh, he foregrounds classical sources on three separate occasions. That's much higher <laughs> percentage of, uh, of, uh, uh, of attention to the classical sources. And I think the aim here is that Gellert is concerned to assert that the resources available to us from the classical sources are plural in nature and that a progressive can search through this material and find tremendously valuable, um, thoughtful, uh, challenging, uh, uh, and useful material uh, and that we shouldn't be uh, quick to allow our, uh, um, to allow the f f um, more conservative uh, and uh, uh, pillars of industry to claim uh, uncontested that they represent the real inheritors of the brilliance of the classical past. Gellert's work on Marx came out in 1934. Two years later, he published another book uh, this one, Aesop Said So. This book is very much Gellert's own kind of little manifesto to that idea that there's a plurality of voices in the classical past and that we are enriched as human beings if we um, look for that plurality of voices and not just assume that voices of progressives were not present in the classical past. I think what Gellert is really interested to do here is mobilize the authority of an ancient figure, but an ancient figure that's not ordinarily thought of as authoritative. It's usually thought of as a children's author or some, somebody that's, you know, a fabulist, you know, pleasant and funny but, uh, and, and uh, edifying for children, but not necessarily uh, sophisticated politically, theoretically, or, uh, uh, or challenging for uh, an adult audience. Gellert challenges that view of Aesop. I think he's also interested in Aesop because returning to ancient sources is a way of indicating to your audience that you're 
concerned to address big issues, important issues, issues of what is good, what is bad, the big questions, as humanists are um, fond of saying uh, these days. And it, finding these big questions for adults in Aesop was a radical gesture on the part of Gellert. The graphic that Gellert reproduces on the cover accompanies a fable about a coal miner and who has a uh, spare room to let. And it's basically about um, uh, the worry in the fable is about uh, the coal miner always soiling things. And what he does, what Gellert does with this fable, is use it to critique uh, William Randolph Hearst, the great uh, newspaper man or founder of yellow journalism, who had in the uh, after uh, in the in the 30s had traveled to Nazi Germany to sort of uh, meet with Hitler thinking that he could reason with him uh, and had also been a um, uh, backer of all sorts of underhanded ways of interfering in university uh, in the free speech of university professors. Basically, he was trying to silence university professors who were interested in examining communism at the time. So, and that was going on at uh, Columbia University. Uh, so what this image is called Hearst and Columbia. And he's showing that Hearst, with this Nazi insignia, is soiling the American flag. And the soiling is both by by soiling, I think, uh, Gellert means both by uh, uh, being, going to Germany to meet with Hitler and, by, uh, and his violations of the First Amendment rights of uh, an academic freedom at Columbia University. Gellert's main concern in this book, I think, is really clear in this frontispiece that he produces. Here we have a portrait of Aesop next to a picture of a mural painter on his ladder. And what we have here is Gellert identifying very much a political alliance, I think, between the figure of Aesop and the contemporary mural artist. Notice that the side of his face is aligned with the ladder. His, the ladder uh, frames Aesop's ear like he's, like, listen to him, Aesop said so. And the mural work, mural painter is looking up in a very uh, inspiring kind of way. So what, what Gellert is going for here is the suggestion that um, Aesop said so. Because he said so, it's authoritative and it's interesting and that we should listen to it. But behind that is Gellert's insistence that in antiquity is a voice that we should not neglect.